Welcome to the Atheist in Recovery podcast, where we talk about finding hope in recovery. And now your host, Dr. Adina Silvestri. everyone, and welcome to episode five of the Atheists in Recovery podcast. I'm excited for you to meet my next guest, Tom Bannard. We have a wide-ranging conversation today. We talk about the state of addiction treatment and recovery in the United States. We talk about supporting loved ones and how societal recovery is so important in the treatment of substance abuse disorder. We talk about mass incarceration and the drug use policy in the United States and what Tom thinks about the future of addiction recovery. I think you'll be interested to hear what he has to say. All right, now on to my guest, Tom Bannard. He is the program coordinator for Rams and Recovery at Virginia Commonwealth University. He is a certified alcohol drug counselor and has spent most of his career working in homeless services at Caritas. A person in long-term recovery, Tom is an advocate for people in recovery who are struggling with a substance use disorder. Tom has played a key role in the growth of collegiate recovery at VCU, spending his first two and a half years as a volunteer on the project team until he was hired in October of 2015 as the program's first coordinator. VCU's program has grown rapidly in the past two years, with more than 60 students attending meetings on a weekly basis. Recovery housing, a recovery clubhouse open seven days a week, 15 weekly recovery groups on campus, and two family education programs. Tom is passionate about changing the way we treat substance use and firmly believes that we must improve our systems of care by focusing on long-term recovery supports, allowing easier access to treatment and recovery resources, educating and supporting family members, and reducing stigma around substance misuse. Okay, let's get started. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I thought we could start by going to uh, the very beginning uh, and talk about what drives you to do this, this work, this collegiate recovery work every day. I feel like it could be sometimes pretty heartbreaking work. You know, um, so I've worked in the recovery field for more than 10 years now. And um, the first seven years of my career, I worked in homeless services at a local organization called Caritas um, and uh, worked with uh, people experiencing homelessness and people struggling with addiction. And um, And people would kind of always ask me that question um, uh, about that work as well. And, um, and I kind of find the opposite. I find that there's a tremendous amount of hope um, in recovery and in um, And what happens, not just to individuals, but in their families and the people surrounding them when they get into recovery. Um, So I've actually found it to be extremely hopeful work and um, really, um, you know, uplifting. I uh, have always worked in uh, programs that have a focus on long-term recovery and um, providing, you know, uh, services over a long period of time and that are that are not really uh, time limited. Um, so uh, that's been a real joy, and 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 that um, kind of reflects uh, my own recovery journey. That uh, you know that's been a, a long term process, and I've benefited tremendously from the consistency of relationships and people within that recovery journey. Um, and so that's kind of the, the type of uh, community that, you know, I've always tried to be a part of building uh, is this kind of ongoing support system rather than, you know, hey, we're going to treat you for 30 days or 90 days. And then, um, 
you know, discontinues in the service relationship when, you know, uh, you know, and I think that's actually a really uh, challenging thing as well. Uh, you know, for providers, if you're only seeing people when they're really very ill um, and you're not seeing them on the other side of it, you're not seeing them give back and, and change people's lives. That would be a really hard space for me to work in, but that's, that's not the space I work in. Yes, it can be very difficult to work uh, as a provider in this field. Um, but thankfully, we have amazing programs uh, in, in the Richmond area. Um, so I spoke with uh, a mutual friend of ours briefly yesterday, Ann Moss Rogers. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you that don't know, Ann Moss Rogers is um, she's a suicide loss survivor. She speaks a lot on mental health. Um, and she does a lot for our community as well. And I said, you know, what are what are some things that you'd want to know about about Tom and his work? And first of all, she you know said amazingly nice things about you, and um, you know that you're just so driven um, on a day to day basis, which I agree with. Um, and then she also said, you know, talk about the family education program. Talk about this amazing program that helps families recover and not just the individual. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, the family education program is something that I feel extremely passionate about. It's one of the few things when I, when I moved over to VCU from Caritas that we, I, I kept with. Um, and so, um, so we've been operating that group that meets at 630 on Thursday nights for seven years. It's a partnership with North Star Community, uh, which is a recovery-focused congregation. And uh, the focus is on education. There's a natural kind of support component, but what we really try to do is get providers to, you know, uh, send their clinicians to talk to families about substance use disorders. And it really came out of this need in our community for family education, but kind of most of our providers are small providers and they can't kind of do it by themselves. And so when we come together, we can create something that's really awesome. Um, and, and so that's what we did. The first two years we did it at the healing place and um, we had, you know, three people some weeks, two people some weeks and, um, and kind of uh, just kept, kept doing it because we thought it was important and then uh, moved it to a different location and uh, got some different providers involved. And, and now it's a, you know, a good group of 20, 30, even more people some weeks. Um, so um, I, I love that work. I love working with families. Um, uh, I think of it as an exercise in kind of clinical humility um, in that, you know, you work with families, um, you know, that are working really hard to help their loved ones heal and help their loved ones get better. And a lot of times, uh, unfortunately, they're, they're sometimes shamed by um, other people um, uh, in terms of what they're trying to do to save their life, loved ones' lives, or they're even sometimes shamed by professionals who are kind of using uh, some, some, some dated or some inaccurate uh, uh, language and, and uh, around you know, enabling and codependency, which uh, you know, are, are generally um, overused and often unhelpful. <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, I feel really strongly about kind of providing quality education to families so that they can, they can change the dynamic and they can change the odds a little bit in their family. Um, but I call it an exercise in clinical humility for me because I've worked with so many of these brave, uh, families uh and and some of them have had terrible results you know like like ann moss i mean i know ann moss did everything she could um and and so i know that um you know sometimes families do kind of all the right things that have an awful result and um and sometimes families don't really do the right things and have a good result um and and so you know it when you sit with families week after week um, you just you just learn how to be with people and um, and walk alongside them and, and try to be helpful along the way, um, especially in, in residential facilities. I think us as professionals uh, will 
we'll get into this feedback loop of like everything we say is right because you know generally the folks that don't follow our directions and come back are not coming back because things are great you know they're coming back because they're struggling and so when we're like oh well we were right about that you know we told you to, to do x y or z and you didn't do it and so you know it kind of reinforces this thing about you know we're always right about everything and I don't think any of us are smart enough about the disease of addiction. Um, smart enough and, about it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I do, I do love working with families and I, I was really blessed to have, uh, really quality supports for our, my, our family. Um, and, um, when I was getting into recovery and so I just believe in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. And so what are some of the things that you hear from the families that keep them coming back? Well, I think it matters to have community, you know, and, and, but, uh, it also matters to have resources. So, um, you know, I think the things that we do is we provide education about addiction people, when people gain understanding education about addiction, um, they increase their empathy. They, they under, start to understand that their loved one is dealing with a bad disease. They're not a bad person. Um, and that can change the, the dynamics of communication. And then resources, you know, I, I compare uh, finding resources around mental health and substance use to playing a game of shoots and ladders. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sometimes you're lucky enough to know somebody or you have insurance or, you know, all of those different things. Um, it's, but it's too much of a roll of the dice. Um, so there's resources. So when you, you know, show up every week, you, you, you meet people and you learn things. And then, then the last thing is community. You know, you gotta have people to walk alongside you. Um, so. Um, yeah. 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 And I know that I've referred many individuals to the family uh, education program. Um, and, I, and I sometimes am a participant, so <laughs> it's a great program. So thank you for, for that. Well, we appreciate your contributions to that. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to get you on the schedule again. I don't, and Denise is managing it now. Um, but yeah, uh, one less thing, Tom, for you to manage. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought maybe we could transition a little <clears throat> and talk uh, some more about Rams in recovery. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, so Rams in Recovery, we um, we're a collegiate recovery program that's at, on campus at Virginia Commonwealth University, um, and uh, we believe that students shouldn't have to choose between uh, education and their recovery. And so, uh, you know, I think that people don't tend to argue with me when I say. Uh, college campuses are recovery hostile environments. Um, people tend to, to get that when I say that. And, um, and so, you know, for folks to be able to have a productive and um, happy uh, college experience while being in recovery, it, it means that, you know, they need to find some support. And so I think that's really what we, what we do with Rams in Recovery. Um, so we are structured supports for students in recovery uh, at VCU and um, believe in many pathways to recovery. So we have a number of different um, recovery groups at, uh, at VCU, 12-step um, groups, smart recovery groups, uh, refuge recovery, all recovery with some writing focused meetings. Um, so we host meetings in our space. Um, we, uh, also, uh, we have a scholarship program for students that are in recovery. Uh, we have recovery housing. Um, and right on recovery, what's that? You have recovery housing right on campus. Mm -hmm. it's a, it, it, we have a couple of units in a, uh, that are apartment units in our residence hall. Um, and I uh, have a supportive uh, seminar for the students that participate in that. Um, and so that's been a really cool thing we've done the last two years. Um, starting to, to grow a little bit. It's, it was six people the first two years, and uh, I think we'll be more next year. So that's exciting. Um, and then we do a lot of kind of outreach on our campus. Um, so um, medical school, uh, you know, health sciences, um, psychology, social work. Uh, so we guest lecture in, in a number of uh, 
classes. We do naloxone training. Uh, we do recovery ally training for, for faculty, staff, and students um, to, to help people. You know, what we really want to do is, is create a recovery supportive environment. We want to change that uh, recovery hostile environment to a recovery supportive environment. And, um, and so that means engaging our allies and really uh, teaching, teaching our, um, you know, well-intentioned uh, coworkers and, and other folks that are on this campus, you know, how do you, how do you be more supportive to students in recovery? Uh, and how do you help people that are struggling with substance use disorders uh, resolve those challenges and, and get into recovery or at least get, you know, stable so they can be productive again? And do you find the teachers and uh, the faculty at the university engaging in this? I mean, are, are they are they sort of sort of complacent or are they are, do you see them more engaged and, and helpful with the students? Um, so, I mean, I've been really pleased with our recovery ally turnout for those trainings. So we've been doing them almost two years. Um, it's a three hour training, so it's not a light, um, you know, commitment. Um, and we've trained more than 300 faculty and staff and another couple hundred students um, in the three hour training. So I feel really good about the progress that we've made. We kept thinking that when we post these trainings, they'd stop filling because uh, we'd hit our kind of max of people that are interested. Um, but I have a training, uh, well, it's training on Thursday that's full. It's 20 plus people. So, you know, I feel really good about that. It's amazing. So I see, I see a few college students in my practice here in Richmond and one of the things that they say to me is that um, they don't feel comfortable going to meetings. Um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe they don't believe in a supreme being or, or a higher power. Uh, you know, what what would you say to students um, that are in that in that arena? You know, how how could you show them that, show them that there are more than one way to 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 gain this this sort of community that you talk about? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think that, you know, um, one of our challenges in addressing substance use disorders um, has been for a long time that um, in, in most places, um, AA and NA um, have been pretty much the only option and for people. And so they really kind of dominate the landscape and um, AA and NA are, are wonderful. Um, and um, tremendous supports um, have a lot of uh, research to support their efficacy, though they're not, you know, kind of, it's not a science. Uh, it didn't kind of, it's not an intervention that came out of science. It's really, it's really a community um, uh, based uh, intervention where a couple of folks figured out how they could kind of support each other and stay in recovery. Um, but, uh, you know, we haven't done a, a good enough job creating other systems of support. And so, um, you know, but what I try to explain to folks that are new to recovery or exploring recovery is that recovery is a whole lot more than just not using. Mm -hmm. And it is very hard for people to just sit there and focus on what they can't do. You know, like, I can't drink, I can't drink, I can't drink. Um, Instead, you know, we want to find really productive things for people to do. And, and when we talk about that, because while a lot of our students do 12-step recovery, a number of them don't. Um, and uh, so we really talk about pillars of recovery. Um, and for us, we define our pillars of recovery as um, community, you know, so finding a way to find, you know, find the people that, don't look at you like you have three heads when you say, I know I burnt my life to the ground, but I really feel like using. you got to find the people that get that, understand that, um, people that you can you know, share things with that you don't feel judged by. Um, I think we just need that as human beings. And, and a lot of us uh, come into recovery with a certain amount of shame and uh, regret. Uh, so I think we need community. We need spaces to gather and uh, people to gather with that won't judge us. Um, so, you know, so that's, that's, 
that's, I think, one of the, the keys there. The other two pillars for us are growth and service, you know, um, that this idea that the same person is probably going to use substances again. Um, and so if we don't make um, some changes and some positive uh, changes in our life, that, you know, coping mechanism or thing that we turn to um, uh, for enjoyment or whatever the reasons that we use, that's going to be a good idea again if, if we don't make some change to our lives. So, so exchange think, the bad behavior for something else. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think, yeah, exchange, um, you know, work on, you know, sometimes there's things in our past that, that pushed us towards use. Sometimes, um, you know, uh, we don't feel comfortable in social situations and that influenced our use. Sometimes, you know, we are just adventurous and, uh, and uh, substances are, you know, uh, for a lot of people for a long time, we're a great vehicle to be more adventurous, um, mm. until, until they're not, <laughs> or until it's a big problem. <laughs> so, yeah. So I think, you know, that, um, you know, really working, you know, and that's an individual path for people, but for some people that's doing step work in 12 step programs, for some people that's doing some work in smart recovery, for some people that's going to therapy or, um, doing, you know, group group counseling. Um, some people, part of that is going to school, you know, or, or pursuing meaningful, uh, purposeful things in their lives um, can be a really big part of growth. And then our last pillar that we talk about is service, you know, altruism and service, um, you know, really solidify people's journeys uh, in a way that I don't think, you know, other things can, you know, like, when, when we're of service to people, uh, it, it transforms our pain um, into something that's helpful. You know, service gives pain meaning. Um, and um, most of us get to recovery uh, from pretty dark spaces. Um, and so, you know, early in recovery, I was always questioning why did this happen to me or why, why, why did I get this thing where I can't stop using and it did all this damage to, to my, you know, the people around me. And, um, and I was really fortunate to, to be in a community that valued service and really push people towards service. And, and I had something happen in my first year of recovery, which was that I had a, a cousin uh, reach out for help and, uh, I took her to a recovery meeting and uh, and she ended up getting into recovery not too long after that. And so so that service that I was able to be of to her meant that I never had to question why I went through what I went through again, you know, because I had this opportunity to introduce her to some things that that I had learned, not because I was really good and had really done all these great things but because I had burned my life to the ground. Um, I was much more helpful to her uh, than I would have been uh, had I just been uh, kind of kicking butt and taking names. So. Right, right. Yeah. And then who knows what, what path she may have gone down if, if she didn't have you there to, yeah. to sort of help her in, in that way. So that's, yeah, that's great. I love that. What um, do you normally gift things to individuals are you a gifter um so for instance people are always asking me you know what are the top three podcasts you listen to or books is, is that something that you that you do um or recommend make recommendations well um yeah so um for family members um uh the the kind of the i I tend to be a reader. So um, uh, for family members, I really love um, Get Your Loved One Sober. And um, there's a, another book called um, Love First um, that are both pretty, pretty good introductions to uh, dealing with a family member struggling with a substance use disorder. Um, for everyone that's interested in recovery, I love the Recovery Research Institute. So recoveryanswers.org. Um, it's, um, it's out of Harvard University and provides some really great summaries of recovery-related research. Um, and I think it's a really great space to, to start to look at some of the recovery science, uh, which is still a very, very young field. 
Um, so I love, I love the, the work that they do uh, at the Recovery Research Institute. And I think that's a great uh, resource for people. Um, the other book that I, I, I think, uh, trying to think about the, the books that have been most influential to me in terms of my own um, kind of advocacy type efforts. Um, and uh, the three that come to mind for me um, are um, uh, Recovery Rising, Bill White. This is his new memoir that I just love. And I think as a, as a person in recovery or anyone that's interested in the field of addiction and recovery science, uh, it's just a wonderful kind of uh, journey through his life and, and how all of that unfolded. Um, and it's very readable. Um, and a lot of kind of life lessons and challenge questions in it. Um, and then the other two, um, uh, uh, the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander, um, which is, um, you know, uh, about uh, mass incarceration. And uh, I think that read in combination with um, uh, Johan Hari's book, Chasing the Scream. Um, those are, those are the, those two together are the books that most changed how I think about substance use um, and, uh, uh, and, and how I think about substance use policy in the United States and um, kind of how far we're missing the boat by. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I don't know, the, the easier read is the Johan Hari book, The Chasing the Scream. It's, it's a, um, it's kind of a better story, but, um, the, the work by Michelle Alexander, I think should just be required reading for all Americans. <laughs> wow. I will have to check those out as well. <laughs> Thank you for that. So now I'm going to sort of ask a little bit of a, of a woo woo question. Um, so if you had a time machine, just go with me here. If you had a time machine and you could travel yeah. to the future, okay. what would you see? What would recovery now? Now you're not alive. This is way in the future. What would right. recovery look like? Um, interesting question. Um, I think that I think it would be. Um, I think where we're going uh, in terms of the recovery movement uh, is for um, many many pathways and more accessible pathways for different people. Um, I think that uh, we, uh, we have this real focus, at least from a dollars and cents standpoint, in terms of money that goes into uh, mental health and substance on more and more treatment. And while I think that treatment is, uh, is good, um, I really think that the future of uh, of the recovery movement is is going to be in uh, recovery community organizations, and you know whether that's something like what we do that happens to be on a college campus, or whether that's something that like uh, they do at McShin or um, Sarah Center, or there's some, um, CCAR in Connecticut is a wonderful example of a recovery community organization. But basically, you know people people recover within community. And I think professional help is really important um, and really can help people get to that kind of permanent, stable community. But there's just so much more uh, leverage that can happen through community. People have opportunities to be of service. Um, and then people um, in recovery tend to love to be of service. And um, and so I think there we want to, build more and more opportunities for folks, not just folks that do 12 step recovery, but folks of all different recovery pathways yeah. to, to be of service, to be involved. Um, and, um, yeah, I think we have a lot of work to do on figuring out what that looks like. Um, but I, I really see a, a, a future where, you know, um, you know, maybe Amer every American has access to, you know, a recovery community organization within a reasonable, uh, you know, amount of space. <laughs> um, so, 
um, that's what that's the thing that I would I'm really most interested in more integration of recovery into employment environments. Wow. You know, we have um, employee groups that are recovery groups. Um, we see that really effectively used with um, you know doctors and um, healthcare professionals um, and lawyers. So I think that there's real space for that. That's kind of all in in line with these kind of uh, non-professional uh, interventions and supporting these non-professional interventions around substance use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. So as we wrap up the interview, um, one final question. If you could write a phrase on a billboard for all to see, what, what would it say? Um, I don't know. You know, I would probably say something, something to the effect of, I think there is something to some, you know, saying something to the effect of we do recover. And I think people, people do recover and, and get into recovery all the time. Um, but I think that the, probably the space that I would, uh, if, if I had a big billboard, I would probably, uh, do something to uh, address mass incarceration. So uh, it might say something like, the United States has uh, 50 times the overdose rate of Portugal, who has decriminalized drug use. <laughs> and, and not that like you could change people, you know, you can't change people on a billboard, but maybe you get them thinking. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and, and the reason that I, I, w I really would want to try to find a way to focus on, on mass incarceration, um, in, and drug policy is that I think that stigma is such a huge barrier to treatment and recovery. And it's also, it, it layers, uh, additional damage. Um, you know, some, you know, substances certainly can be damaging to people. Um, we've done, we've had a ton of collateral damage from substance use policy, probably significantly outweighing the, the, the uh, damage of addiction. Um, and so if we could destigmatize um, uh, addiction um, and destigmatize getting help, I think that that would help tremendously with not just the recovery movement, but it would, it would, uh, help people who may not need recovery have have a happier life. You know, it would it would um, limit the progression of the illness for for many people. Um, and uh, so, um, and I think stigma. You know, stigma keeps people from getting help. Um, it's a huge barrier. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, how can people best reach you and, and, and get to know more about the wonderful work that's that's going on with you and Rams and Recovery? Um, so, um, so people can um, email me, recovery at vcu.edu is probably the easiest way to get in touch with me. Um, we have a Rams and Recovery Facebook page, which we're pretty good about answering, um, responding to people on. Um, so those are probably the two easiest ways. Um, and then um, uh, recovery.vcu.edu is our website and, and my direct number's on there. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate yeah. it. Awesome. Thank you, Adina. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Atheists in Recovery podcast. For more great info and to stay up to date, head over to atheistsinrecovery.com.